Thank you for joining us today to find out how to really make a web series. Ha ha, can any of us tell them that? It, it, uh, it changes every day. Uh, the things that the Independent Production Fund used to fund five years ago, we would never fund today. Things have evolved so much in the industry in such a short time. Uh, we've actually invested $7 million in 70 web series, and uh, it is pretty fascinating to see the evolution of it. And yet we all feel, I think, that we're still pioneering. None of us really knows what works, and it does change day by day. So what we tell you today may not be true tomorrow, but we have a wealth of advice here um, on what's working, what isn't working, content-wise, business-wise, so I hope we can drag as much as we can out of everybody here in the next hour. Um, we're going to cover as much as we possibly can, and um, I think we'll see how far we get. These guys, I think most of them are going to be around the weekend, so if you don't hear it now, you can grab them during the weekend. So let's start with content. Um, what is working? What isn't working? Where are audiences gravitating? What are the tricks about content that is going to be successful? So, um, Carter, would you like to start off with that challenge? Sure. Um, I think that, the, you know, the content, it really depends on the type of content and what your goal is and what you're aiming at and what works and what doesn't work and what your end goal is. Um, but what I found the, the biggest mistake that creators make to avoid is not trusting the audience when they're starting out a series because you have to grab them on the internet from the beginning and they tell too much backstory to set everything up. As a creator, you know your world. That will come through in the writing if you do it well and you don't need to overtell the story and make it all expositional and lose people because I've seen so many more second episodes of series that are better than first episodes because of that. After they've set the world, then they rock on the characters and they dialogue. And that first episode, it's just a killer because people won't keep watching because they're distracted and another show is a click away. Thank you. Brad, you can add a lot to that too. Yeah, I, I agree with obviously what Willie's saying, but my perspective would be that everybody wants to chase the next thing that's happening. This is in, that's in, all of that. And I think that's a huge mistake. Uh, look at uh, the podcast serial that was huge this year. I mean, there's so many crime dramas on TV and crime everywhere, and she went out and did something differently in a way that really, really worked. And I think what it comes down to is story. You know, if, you can, if you're passionate about something, if you understand an area, and you can make something really good, you should focus on that and not try and chase the next thing or the other thing. Now, that being said, you do have to look at the parameters of what type of content you're doing. You know, every market's not the same, every area is not the same in scope and size, you have to be sensitive to that. But I think the thing that's lacking with everything that doesn't work is that the story's not that great. So if you concentrate on that, I think you're, you're way ahead of the game. And when you look at the story, I agree with everything you just said, you know, know your content and then know your market. And that's going to be able to get you an audience to watch that story. You know, we all, uh, like I write myself, and I'm tempted to think that everybody's going to love this, but that's just never true. You know, no matter how good it is. So after you get your passion, you can identify your market and get that story out there. You know, make sure you're putting your energy in the right place to get the right eyeballs on it, people that will then become your advocates and spread your story for you. And also, um, I think it's important to just not try to please everybody. Um, the internet is so different from television where there's you know, millions of channels out there and you're fighting for those eyeballs. So you really have to try to find your niche you know, audience and, and, and cater towards them. Um, are there any genres that don't work? That they should stay away from that I mean work as far as making huge audience attraction making money that kind of thing well, I, it's hard to say I wouldn't say there's anything that doesn't work per se more I'd more say exactly you know what Ali was saying which is make sure that you've you've really got your audience pegged whatever that audience is and then you do have to ask yourself the question is it a large enough group of people you know if it's if it's uh, you know Norwegian-speaking uh, horse riders that you know that have uh, that are left-handed. You've got a fairly you know niche audience. You've got to think that's not broad enough to build a business around. But uh, that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to you've got to say as well. I mean, the other thing I would add is that online, you know, remember it's a younger audience in general. Um, there aren't a lot of big senior web series out there, for better or for worse. Um, they're probably more on traditional television. So that is one thing I think to, to think about. 
I would think when you're writing uh, a, and producing a killer drama, um, it's really hard to have that go viral like just on a YouTube. You really need to think about your distribution and your platform. I've seen some amazing shows that just can't get views, you know, if you're not spending money on marketing or if you don't have a star to attract it. Um, that's just what I've seen and experienced with a few shows. There might be conflicting opinions, but I think it's really hard to get a drama to go viral just on a, you know, ad-based platform that's not pushing the show for you, um, if it's just there. Well, okay, we're talking a lot about audiences, and I think that's a really crucial thing for everyone to understand. So, um, who are these audiences? Where are they? What's their attention span? Um, Enrique, you've had a lot of experience with audiences. What do you think? Well, my recommendation for creators is that they have to figure out who their audience is first. You know, even before um, you know they decide where to release or what the time, uh, the timing of, of their releases is, whether it's batch <laughs> or or whatnot. You know, is their audience female, male? What's their age group, and where does that? Where, where can you find that audience? You know, is it on YouTube or is it on all platforms? Um, if the answer is they're probably on all of them because we're we all watch a certain number of YouTube videos, um, and we all are on Facebook or on Snapchat or on Vine. So there's overall there's kind of a, a massive audience um, that does have some overlap. But you have to decide, you know, how you're going to target your audience on each one of those platforms. Because to be honest, I think um, looking at it from a, a platform agnostic perspective will actually help your brand, will help your uh, your content and your release. Because then hopefully you can grab the million eyeballs here and the other hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thousand and one. <laughs> <laughs> I swore I put it on the other server. Um, and so you have to find out where the audience is you know, and, and target them. And, and, what, and what is their attention span? Are they binge watching? Are they watching weekly, twice a week? both. I, I think depending on, on the program that you have, they may decide to tune in on your schedule if you uh, accustom your audience to, to come to your channel Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, if you've got a drama and, and the funding you know, essentially allowed for you know, only a set number of, of episodes, you know, 10, 12, 15, then you may want to, uh, to, to binge watch and do it all in a batch release. Um, and so really it, it depends. You know, the, the audience is accustomed to, to what you taught them. And what's their average time online? Are they watching for hours at end or are they it's watching shrinking. five to minutes? To be honest, it's shrinking. It used to be three to five minutes. Now it's, it's pushing to three minutes uh, as a max. So you have a very limited time to, to engage them, especially if they're new viewers. Um, and also looking at the different platforms, I think there's a different experience if you're watching on JTS to Dailymotion or YouTube or Facebook. And so, and what we've seen, I've seen some, not just necessarily the uh, scripted series, but just creators in general, if they're posting on Facebook and you as a user are still allowing autoplay in your Facebook feed, you're getting the first three, five seconds autoplaying with no audio. So if you use that to your advantage, you have to think about how you're gonna engage the audience uh, that's scrolling through and sees it on their on their timeline. How are you going to engage them with no audio? You know, are you doing a voiceover and an intro in those first five seconds? You lost. You know, so try to engage them to get them to click, to have it open up and play, and then you've got them. And then maybe you can bring them back to your website. Maybe you can bring them back to your YouTube channel or Daily Motion channel, wherever it is that you. Once you've captured them, you can you can play with them a little bit more. But the trick is now how to engage them in those first five seconds because that's the most crucial. Ali, on broadband TV, what's the experience there? We're you know, primarily focused on YouTube as a platform at broadband TV, but I think um, you know, further to what Enrique said is you know, once you've kind of figured out where your audience lives, um, you really need to study the platforms and, and understand you know, what works best because um, like YouTube, for example, reaches more 18 to 34 year olds than any single cable network. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's exactly where your audience is going to be. So um, you really have to kind of um, think about what, what platform makes the most sense. And, and right now is a really good time in the industry. There's, um, you know, Twitter and Facebook have announced that they're launching video platforms this year. Um, Vessel is another company that's in beta with their platform. There's Daily Motion. There's you know your own owned and operated website. Um, so there's a lots of options out there, but you really have to kind of think it through. Think it through before you just slap it online. And what are you finding about audiences in particular? How long are they staying online on broadband? 
it, it's, it's very short form content. So uh, people are creating, you know, scripted web series that are like, you know, a minute and a half long, and they're like on season 12, episode 50 of it. And, and so uh, there's really no boundaries, but definitely, um, again, like for a platform like YouTube, short form content is what dominates. Really, yeah. um, and how many episodes? I mean, can they get away with six episodes and disappear for a year, or what happens with this draft? I mean, with every platform, I think consistency is important. So um, you can't, you know, you really can't just kind of produce something and, and, and leave it there. You, you have to be prepared. You have to have um, follow-up content uh, in order to be successful, definitely. Um, that's the only way you can kind of build a sustainable audience is through that consistency. I think that from what I've seen, I agree with the, you know, uh, the platforms that are primarily people are watching on their laptops or mobile phones or whatever. JTS, actually, our biggest viewership is through our Roku channel, and soon we're going to have Chromecast integration and a Vizio channel and other things. We had a lot of people watching on TV. Longer is better. And it's honestly going to be an over my dead body uh, before we binge release a season um, because you lose the opportunity to promote. And often what people think they want is not what they actually want. When the episode's a minute and a half, when it's three minutes, yeah, they don't want to wait a week. When you have 10 minutes or more episodes, um, you, you, you lose what I call the water cooler effect. And I would go as far as to say that Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, shows like that would not have been as effective uh, with a Netflix model. And up until season two of House of Cards, every panel I was on, nobody knew the name of the main character of House of Cards when I asked them because they binge watched it and then they forgot. You know, you need that time to fall in love with characters. If you have a longer scripted series, or yeah, a scripted series with longer episodes, um, I highly, highly recommend that you release weekly or some other schedule that is not binge. And then it's available once it's released. Then the people that want to binge watch, they can wait if they want. But you get that opportunity to promote. You get, you know, and it can also help with production schedules and whatnot, post and stuff. But that's. <laughs> That's good, good advice. Um, Spencer, college humor, what happens with platforming there and audiences there? What are your thoughts on humor? Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, our primary destination is YouTube, for sure. I mean, we're, we're enormous. We have 9 million subscribers. But we've, we're starting to do Vessel and uh, you know, Samsung and Facebook is getting suspiciously large. Um, so because of their autoplay feature, I think all the views are fake. Not fake, but you know, suddenly there's a whole lot of views and no one has ever seen it probably. Um, but I, I think, you know, for, for us, like the YouTube's where we go, but really it's all about social. Is that it doesn't, it feels like we could be on Daily Motion, we could be anywhere because it's Twitter and Facebook and, you know, Tumblr and, and all of that way that, that we find our audience coming in. So. And how, how would producers best? determine which platform is best for them. I, you know, all, all, all due respect to everyone in the world, it's just YouTube's the biggest, so why wouldn't you go there? You know? and, and are there some that would actually license the projects ahead of time that they should be pitching to? Um, I think there are. I think Vimeo is getting into some originals work. Um, I think that they're, like, why create a barrier to entry for yourself? You should just make everything that you possibly can. Um, so don't, I, I would find a way to make whatever you're gonna make without funding, without a license deal, without, without anything like that, because that'll just stop you. And especially for the people that are making their, their first or their 10th web series, it's, you're probably just not experienced enough to get, make a lot of money doing it. So it, it's like your 20th web series that you're probably, ha have kind of found your voice, have found, your ability to make things, I found the community that can support these sort of low budget um, adventures. So I, I would say get as much content up as quickly as you can. And what do you think about exclusivity? Should they go to a whole bunch of platforms or focus on one? Yeah, I'd say do everything you possibly can to get as many eyeballs as possible. Because it's, it's, all, it's all about learning, I think, for the first, you know, what do they say, like Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours, you might as well, it's the first many years that you're making web series. You should do it. Get as many people to look at it as possible. What do you think about that, Enrique? 
Oh, I agree. Um, yeah. We've seen yes. The, <laughs> the most successful web series out there are, are being platform agnostic. I, I preach that. Mind you, I, I still may ask for, hey, give us a, a couple days window of exclusivity. Maybe there's a little bit of extra support that we can provide. Um, so I think that's a conversation that you need to have um, with Vimeo, with YouTube, with, with Dailymotion, with JTS. And really try to leverage what you know what you can get out of each platform if you can have that, that conversation, um, because it really comes down to and it leads to promotion of your content. You know, it's it's not just as simple as releasing it on all the platforms, sitting back and waiting for the views you know to, to count up. That's mm -hmm. not going to work. You can release on one or all the platforms if you're not actually hustling to gain those views and build your audience and build a community that's going to come and watch your content. Then it's all for naught. You know, so. Um, I think part of the the, um, the strategy of how you utilize each platform plays into, um, uh, I suppose, you know, your structure of release, your, your windows of, of release. Okay. But Carter, you have, okay, so you have a good example of a I, good Canadian one. What do you I have a strong disagreement, actually. <laughs> Ooh. I'm, on the, um, I'm on the other side, too. To be, oh. to be honest, when a, most independent creators have a limited amount of resources, and so by using a windowing concept from, you know, the future film world, not, you know, the two-day window, we take it when we can get it, if that's what the deal is. Um, but having a longer window, you have a limited amount of resources. So eventually being on every platform, I think is fantastic. But doing it all at once, um, how much can you promote and really give the strength of each audience its due? You can pick, you know, J for JTS, we have a, uh, usually, uh, I think it's a better financial model. You have the chance to make more money. It's definitely more per view when your subscription video on demand. But, you know, you can get, you, they could focus on that. And then after a 90-day window, let's say, then you go to Daily Motion, or you know, or maybe they do Daily Motion first. I'm not trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, you can focus and say, what's college humor? You know, in college humor, what's college humor's strength? You know, how can we help and combine with them? And you know, if they wanted the content too, and you go on, and you can use your limited amount of resources and focus in. And each window, you get a chance to launch again. It's like an exciting new. Now I'm, you know, hey, we're here. And you can use those resources by scheduling it out and eventually be on every platform. And I think you've got a more bang for your buck, more bang for your time. Um, and, but, you know, I, I do understand the shotgun approach. And I'm also coming from it from a longer form perspective that we like longer and longer. So what I am preaching for what I am comfortable with and know might not be the best for one and a half, three minute episodes what some other people are doing. So I'm not saying I'm definitely right in all types, but I know for our content, I strongly recommend windows of time and using your resources to push it out that way. Yeah, I think it really depends on where you are in your, in your cycle. If you're just trying to get a, a show out to prove to people you can do it, then you want to be everywhere for sure. But eventually you get to the point where you worry about money, and as you move in that direction, you have to start thinking about exclusivity. For sure. I mean, we see a lot of the YouTubers that are really successful these days moving to moving to television, moving to other platforms, because ultimately where, where I think the broadcasting system is going is to, I'll call a bunch of platforms, we sort of, the rise of the platforms that's going on, and those will be primarily subscription platforms. They'll be Netflix-like, I think, and, and in order to make the kind of money you'd like to make to actually stay in the business, eventually you'll have to move to a subscription model. So it really depends on what, what place your, your show is at and where you are professionally in, in the cycle. And Brad, you also come at it, at, sorry, um, as a broadcaster, and you're taking broadcast rights when you take web rights, is right? And what, how does that affect everything? Well, typically, and, and we've bought, I think we're at six or seven web series, and I was saying before, we, we've pretty much done a deal for another one, and in each case, uh, we'll put them on the broadcast, but we'll also, we have a, a video on demand platform that's subscription that we sell globally, and that platform is where I'm mostly interested in getting web series for. So there's a, a revenue opportunity there, and the idea is that it's exclusive. I mean, sometimes we acquire exclusive, and obviously you pay more for that. Sometimes I'll take non-exclusive, but knowing that we have a more robust platform than it's just come off of. So I may risk that and just pay less for it. But uh, yeah, it's about trying to develop those subscriber revenues, which which you know, obviously uh, exclusivity is better for. Okay. And then you know, on the topic of that, I, I think one of the challenges with YouTube is that it treats you know, the entire audience the same when the reality is, is that um, 
you know, some of your fans could be super fans. You know, some people could just casually stumble, stumble upon the content. So um, once you've kind of built an audience, is figuring out how you can segment that and understand who it is. And, and so some viewers want the content. They'll pay to have that content three days early, or they'll pay for additional content that wouldn't necessarily be available on YouTube, but you, you know, sell it on your website. So I do think that that factor is important. Well, I think marketing, you've all touched on now a little bit, is really the critical thing. And uh, we've certainly seen that, that the best web series go nowhere unless the marketing is done right. So what, what are your, uh, what's your advice on marketing? I think um, it's not just about marketing. I, I think for like the example I brought in TV, you know, we built tools that creators can use to ensure that you know they're they're going to maximize the audience. So you know, you've built this um, or you've created this content, and now you want to figure out you know how people can discover it. So there's things like just you know keyword optimization, thumbnail optimization. I mean, you know, understanding who's engaging with your content, understanding you know when are you uploading the content um, that's attracting the most viewers. You know, what territories are consuming your content. So all these things, all this kind of this technical aspect of of um, these platforms are important for people to educate themselves. So that, you know, through that, um, you know, they can understand how to better market and get more more eyeballs on the videos. And what is the role of the producer versus the role of the platform? Um, do you want the producers to get out there and do their own marketing, or? I, I think. Um, some of the most successful you know, YouTubers that I've seen, they have a really, really good understanding of the platform. Um, and so they do a lot of that dirty work themselves. But at the same time, um, you, know, you can't do it yourself. So if you've got people that you can utilize, whether it's your audience, whether it's um, you know, friends that, that understand the platform and they can put the time in to help build that audience for you, I think that's critical as well. Okay, Spencer, you have some thoughts. Yeah, I would say uh, embrace the concept of clickbait that on, on the internet, you, you just don't have people's attention for very long. So this, I, I don't want to piss anybody off, but I'm probably not going to watch something called The Gift Episode 15. Just not going to click on it. Um, like we, you know, web series shouldn't be, web episodes shouldn't be titled sh like short film or movie titles dash episode. I want personally individual titles for each episode, because that's gonna, if I haven't seen episode one, I'm not gonna click on episode 15, so you've lost me. So just pretend your whole series is an individual, you know, short form piece of content, you're probably gonna get more viewers, I think. And, you know, bright, flashy thumbnail, use Photoshop, get the two main characters looking at each other, even if they never do in the series. But write the title of the episode in big, bold letters on the thumbnail. You know, that, that sort of stuff, for me, is not, maybe is artistically satisfying, but the, the goal is to get people to watch it. So you have to do those tricks that the platform, you know, the, by that I mean just like the internet, likes. So. And is it important to develop a, a community around your, your characters, your, ep, your episodes? What? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, anything you can do to engage people online, and that's, you know, have the actors in your series tweet out every time there's an episode and create fake Twitter accounts of those characters. I mean, that's, that's a lot of you know, sweat and, and blood, and, but I, I think that's, you're just like investing in yourself and in your own series by doing that. Mm -hmm. Enrique, you got lots to say. And I'll reiterate on, on that point as well, is that um, from a few channels I've seen, whether it's scripted, drama, and there's one example that I've got out with Dad uh, that you may be familiar with. They've done quite well uh, in that respect, and they've been around for a few seasons now, They've cultivated a true audience that, that follows them, that engages with the producer. They've actually crowdsourced script ideas from, from their audience, and that's given them, given the audience, more ownership of this series. You know, and in one of the episodes in particular, um, I was told from, from Jason Lieber, the producer, that this is where he got ideas from the audience, that he went out and asked on Twitter and whatnot, and took true-to-life stories and put them in the script. What better way to have your audience come back six months later and say, "Holy shit, that's my story! You should see this!" And it and it was a really touching. It was a, it was a drama, um, and it was a really heartfelt you know episode. It was it was amazing to see. So he he's able to bring his audience with him. He also crowdsourced subtitles. So in other territories, in France, Spain, Italy, Germany, all of those were crowdsourced from his from his fan base, and then suddenly in those markets, we're able to get a little bit further traction. 
And so he, he was thinking outside of Canada, outside of the US, and beyond. And that is what I, I'd encourage all, all creators to, to think about. Not just scripted, you know, all, all formats. If you look at BuzzFeed as well, um, kind of the, the masters of clickbait in the past, you know, five, 10 years, they evolved. Um, and they also have BuzzFeed France, BuzzFeed Pakistan. There are multiple channels of the exact same content, some of it non dialogue, some of it's just the regular, you know, just, you know, photographs, you know, whether it's funny or, or life tips or whatnot. But now they're, they're titled in other languages. It's a duplicate video, but it's been retitled. Um, and more or less, the video is the exact same, but it's just new, diff new keywords, new titling. It's optimized mm -hmm. for another market, for growing markets outside of North America as well. Mm -hmm. Um, on the, uh, the clickbait titles, I want to give a wholehearted agreement this time. And, um, and, but also throw in a search engine marketing perspective that there is one place that you want to be bland um, and do that episode description and that's on your own website. Because after your show is popular, when people Google show name, episode, whatever, because that's what they're looking for, it'll show up and they can find it. But for your marketing, for your social media, maybe for your title on YouTube or other platforms if you title it, great. But have that on your own website because then people will find it that way. And when they Google it, if they find it with your more clickbaity title and they Google the next episode, they're on your website where you may be selling them stuff, extra materials, other stuff, and you drive them to your site. So. Hmm. Um, from a broadcaster perspective, Brad, you have to you have to represent all the broadcasters of the world right now. Right. Um, we've seen a lot of agreements where the their typical television contracts, where the promotion is controlled by the broadcaster. They don't want those producers to go out there and do anything without their prior approval. What's your opinion on that? I think it's about developing a partnership with the producer because a lot of producers are really good marketers and. We'll actually look at a property and think, wow, there's a lot of great marketing that's built into that. That would be one of the things that's really attractive for us. On the other hand, you have to be careful because uh, we had a producer this year make a documentary for us and he started putting it online and he was totally in violation of a whole bunch of rights, underlying rights, and got us into a lot of trouble because he decided that he was going to market his own you know, show that he was working on with us. So, I think it's about just developing a strong relationship. I mean, one of the values of being with a platform, whether it's a broadcaster, is they bring a lot of audience and they also bring their own platforms. You know, we've got a very vibrant Facebook page and Twitter and so on. So you get to tap into that. But I think it's also incumbent on us to go back to the producer and say, well, what is it you can do? So we will oftentimes work in a bit of, a bit of synergy. And I think that that's probably going to be more of the future, but uh, I think the general rule is the larger the broadcaster you're dealing with, the more they're gonna control like everything as they go down. Uh, and just be sensitive when you're dealing with them. I mean, don't announce the next day after a deal in a press release that you've just done a deal with a network. You know, we had that too. Uh, you know, just defer to the network if they're writing you a check and say, well, what can we do together? And if they're writing you a check, you heard that part. <laughs> yeah, that's your benefit. <laughs> Well, let's talk about money. I think that's a good entree on that one. What do these things cost? What, what's, a net, you know, what's, what's recoupable? Is there financing? Is there revenue? What are the models out there? Um, Carter, do you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, it, it's more and more difficult. Yesterday in my workshop, I did something that I'm going to do again, and it hurts me. <laughs> hurts me to say it. Um, if you want TV quality programming, the best financial model for the average person outside of getting a sponsor to just cut you a check is to do a crowdfunding campaign um, to begin with because there's not been a surefire model emerge for TV quality programming. And I stress that, you know, I've heard words low budget and other stuff. If you're doing a low budget thing that can be done easily and you can do a lot of episodes on a regular basis, then my advice is not to do crowdfunding. Try to get the revenue coming in because you're doing that. But if you're trying to make a show that's like what you see on TV, but for the internet, if your series lives there, um, crowdfunding is probably what you need to consider right now to get it funded because it's going to be extremely difficult to show investors a way that they're going to recoup their money. And that's just the unfortunate reality of where we are. And uh, what well, you mentioned at the beginning saying, you know, things could change tomorrow. I hope that that's something that changes tomorrow because mm -hmm. I don't like saying that. Um, but that's where we're at right now with that. And there are other uh, you know, ways to fund things as well, but you know, to, to get a full budget, very difficult outside of crowdfunding right now. 
to be honest, for TV quality programs. So that's everywhere in the world, not just in Canada. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And Brad, what, what are you seeing when you see these projects come in? How are they being financed? Well, it, it's a real problem. We have to recognize that television from the 1950s until very recently, just, just about everything that was made was made with an audience already there when it was done. It was already pre-sales and other people. And as soon as we moved to the online side, it became very different. But it didn't change the fact that somebody's got to pay for this at the end of the day. Um, typically, what we, we work on with producers at some point, uh, two big crowdfunding shows sort of collapsed halfway through and we stepped in and finished the financing on them, but they got going far enough that we liked them and then we ended up cutting deals and bringing them into, in on the revenue streams. My job when I'm acquiring a web series that's at some point in the cycle, maybe it's early, maybe it's, maybe it's done, is to sit down and develop a transparent revenue model. And that will usually include you know, us giving them some money, but also taking them through the different places. Um, and then getting it on a digital too, because we have a global deal with iTunes and a global deal with Google Play. And oftentimes that's really important because we will sometimes do a very good cut for the producer in order to make sure they get some of that money back. Because for us, a lot of times we've, we've said to them, yeah, we like what you've done, but we're really more interested in the second season than first season. So let's help you get some money back on the first season so that we can get into the second season where we'd like to be. But I think it's about, uh, you know, one of the things that's really happening is transparency. You know, the classic distribution business, distributors basically screwed the producers for an entire generation. I mean, everybody knows it. I mean, it's no surprise. And I think that it's incumbent on us in this age to, because we're in the digital age, to be more transparent and help the producers learn what that budget needs to be for your show. And I like to call that the Goldilocks zone. You know, it's like how far from the sun does a planet have to be to have life. And, in this case, it's what's the budget that gets you enough production value in your genre or area in order to make your show sustainable? It's a very hard question. It's probably the single biggest question that everyone in the television industry is coping with right now, not just the web, but also on the network side. So you have to be cognizant of the fact that that is ultimately the biggest challenge, is trying to figure out where that zone is. And if you know that at least at day one, you know, you're halfway there. You know, I would add that you know, if you if you want to build a, a, a big audience online, you, you don't necessarily need to have a big budget. And so, you know, people are, you know, they automatically they want to make something that's of a, a, a super high quality. But um, a, a good example on YouTube is one of our creators. Um, her name is uh, her channel name is Haunted Sunshine Girl, and she's making you know short form content on, on a very low budget. But she built that subscriber base, uh, and now she's you know over two hundred thousand subscribers. Then it led to a, a book deal, and it led to a movie deal, and now she's obviously able to produce more high-quality content. So, um, you know, n not everybody kind of goes down that exact same path, but there are, you know, we work with thousands of content creators that are now making a living off um, producing their content online, but it took them years to build that audience. It didn't happen overnight. And how about brands and sponsors? Are, are they getting involved with a lot of the projects? They are, but again, it, the brands at the end of the day are also looking to, to reach an audience. So um, they'll only work with you know creators once they've kind of reached a certain level of traction. Mm -hmm. And are you seeing that? Is anybody seeing that with um, dramatic series? Uh. <laughs> it's really, really hard to do a dramatic series because most brands just won't won't get involved till they've already seen it. And even some of the biggest dramatic series, you probably know this, but Breaking Bads and stuff are very hard to find advertisers are because, you know, a high school teacher who's a, who's a meth dealer. Um, brands tend to be very, uh, very conservative and there's this suggestion that if you have an audience, you'll have the advertisers, but, you know, it's not always the case. I think drama is tough that way. Lifestyle, I think, is a little easier. Mm -hmm. We've got a few shows that we've been able to bring them in, but it comes back to reach. If you don't have the reach to start, so I think as a young producer, you think, all right, I'm going to go up and build this on the web. I'm going to bring an advertiser with me on the way there. I think that's probably not going to happen. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult to do. I think if, uh, if you really are trying to go the sponsor out with drama, you have to have another hook besides a great story, um, besides even a track record, like maybe an actor signed on that the brand wants to be associated with. They, there'd have to be a reason beyond the drama because it would be incredibly difficult. Um, and to backtrack, you got to remember I'm a U.S. guy. Um, the IPF is another great source of funding. For <laughs> Thank <us>. you. Yeah. <laughs> well, Carter's also picked up a good web series that the IPF funded, so awesome. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Spencer, you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, what's, what's really interesting to me is the people that are making their web series that are, are 
satisfying to them creatively and not trying to get that web series funded. That use that experience, parlay it into an actual commercial deal with a brand saying, look at my fantastic web series, clearly I can tell a story. Your product is a body spray or, or whatever, you know, Sprite. Hey, the, clearly I'm a filmmaker, I can make these things, now pay me this money, give me $30,000 to make this one spot, Infl you know, inflate your budget for them, and then only actually spend $6,000, and then take the 24K, put it back into the thing you love. That to me is a much smarter business model than <laughs> trying to take your 15 episode series and get it funded that way. Also on sponsors, I just, uh, something that is so underused that I think is a very valuable tip that I try to tell everybody is that there are types of products that may or may not fit your show, but if they do, um, they have huge ad budgets and aren't able to spend money. Liquor companies. If you have a very sexy, racy show, you know, um, I use, there's a reason that if you listen to the radio, adamandeve.com is only on at 2 a.m. They can't get the ad buys. And so if you fit with one of those types of places that have a hard time doing, look at Google AdWords and see what they restrict and what they will not sell advertising for and go after those companies if it fits your show. Um, I, I guess a word from the sponsor, though. I should also just add that we're seeing an average of $3,000 to $5,000 a minute for most of the drama series. And these are, you know, bare-bone budgets, and no one's recouped them yet, though. That's the problem. Um, but does, does that sound way off to any of you? Or They're spending $5,000? dollars 3000 to $5,000 a minute on a drama series. Yeah, is that a lot from I your perspective? I have 30-minute shows I'd like to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you see, we're doing okay at that at that uh, point. That's great. I, that's a high budget for recruitment, though, for sure. For recruitment. Yeah. I mean, the the thing that may change that, I'm hopeful of, anyways, is is the increase of digital distribution sales. I mean, we have some shows that we make for under 10,000 episodes that we're very close. We've got one that I think we're going to do another season of this year, and I think it'll probably come out about 110, 115% of budget, digital only, global, but globally. Yeah. So it's as that digital reach begins to go into more countries and you can sell more. To, and every time a new market opens, you see the numbers of all the old stuff go up and the check comes in and it's, it's larger that quarter. So, I mean, that's one of the things that hopefully will help. Plus, I think there'll be more subscription platforms around the world that will pay something. So you're distributing around the world now? Yes. Um, are there other distributors that you have been dealing with who represent producers who are selling on behalf of the producers around the world? No, no, I haven't seen that emerge. It's mm -hmm. partly because for us it's a, we're, we're a niche, so mm -hmm. it does change things. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the business is very much vertical in that it's national because of copyright and because of history. And what we're really witnessing right now is the movement from a vertical to a horizontal marketplace. And so what you're seeing, you know, Netflix is clearly paving the way by all they're developing in their countries. You're seeing Amazon starting to span the globe, and you've got Google and Apple and Samsung. And so as that horizontal situation takes off, you know, that's going to change a lot of things. And how that ecosystem develops, you know, is anybody's guess. It's going to be a wild, wild period over the next number of years. But what you'll see is more, more people looking for exclusive content for their platforms, and they'll pay for that because they're going to want to have something that other people don't. They're going to want something to, to market. I mean, look at how quickly Amazon ended up with, you know, with a show like Transparent, which we couldn't afford, unfortunately. It would be perfect for us, obviously. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and now it's on Show Me in Canada. It hasn't even shown up on Canadian broadcast yet. It went straight to that kind of platform in order to try and drive those subscribers. So that's a business model that's definitely developing. And drama is the key. People want dramatic series for those platforms now. So, I mean, that's... That's something to think about. You know, will your series have that opportunity to sell into those platforms? And it may be multiple platforms. It may be you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, until they consolidate down the road, in which case I think they'll, they'll probably be you know, two, three tiers of them. They'll be the gigantic ones, and then the next tier, and then the, you know, the more special ones. Well, Enrique, you could also tell us what your experience is. Are the producers coming directly to you to pitch the to Daily Motion, or are you finding that there are distributors who are representing a bunch of them? A little bit of both, I would say. Um, some of them do come to us directly, but unfortunately, the the company line, um, not just with us, but even with uh, the other free open platforms like YouTube um, and Vimeo, let's say, are 
you need to prove it first. Prove that there's an audience. Let's see what the, the actual audience and, and view expectation is and the results are before we can commit to anything because we can't take a flyer on that. Mm -hmm. um, there's just way too much competition for, for, for audience on, on content overall. Um, and so as much as I would love to start commissioning series, I need to know that there's a track record and, and there's um, already an ex existing audience. Um, we have supported um, with some funded initiatives at Daily Motion, as have the other platforms too. Um, but each one of those has been uh, on existing partnerships that have proven over the course of a, a year or two, a season or two of their events. And we've been able to be to confidently say, all right, here's a budget. Uh, we now have some exclusivity, whether it's an exclusive window on live streaming or on BOD, et cetera. Each one of those is unique. Um, but they then make sense after we've been able to establish a, a track record. You saw that with High Maintenance on Vimeo as well. The first season was free. And so Vimeo didn't go out and commission a brand new series. It was an existing series that built an audience that was, was proven. And they decided to make it their, their, um, their flagship. I want to back that up because we're owned by the same people that own Vimeo and we work in the same building. And they told us that we had to prove something on Vimeo. We're like, Wait, what? <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> well, Spencer, now that you have the microphone, <laughs> now that you know you have to prove and you, you were shocked by how our budgets are, tell me, what are the tricks for making um, a low-budget drama series? How, what would you recommend? Like, are there crew tricks? Like, what, what's behind the scenes? What are the ways to make, keep the budgets down? You know, it's all, I think there's a couple tricks. I think it's getting your, it's promoting people who probably don't deserve the position you give them. So you're taking gaffers and making them DPs, right? And you're taking wardrobe assistants and making them costumers. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we do. Um, we watch videos and commercials online, see who all the seconds are, and then say, hey, you want to be a DP? You've been gaffing for 15 years. And because they know, I mean, people are very talented. They just don't always have the opportunity in the marketplace to showcase their talent. So we, we find people who are very hungry and excited and are willing to work at very low budget money because probably they make money elsewhere. You know, we're not, we have very small budgets. We don't pay anybody's rent. You know, we basically, our model is like, are you sitting at home watching House of Cards? Instead of doing that, how about you make 150 bucks? You know, um, so that's, that's our strategy. So it's mainly the crew is, is where you save the money. Yeah. yeah. And how, are there a lot of shooting days? Are they a lot shorter than for a typical television program? What are well, we're a, little, we're a little snobby. So we'll, we'll take full 12 hour shoot days for one three minute sketch. Mm -hmm. um, also though, we'll shoot three sketches in one day. Yeah. You know, it just kind of depends on the content. And all of our stuff is two and a half, three, four minutes. So it's, I think you have to find efficiencies there and, and realize that uh, a lot, of, a lot of the things don't, well, this is a stupid statement, don't matter. Uh, that like you, can get, you can get away with uh, having lower production quality on the internet that you can't elsewhere. So like, the location doesn't matter. Nobody's ever like, hey, check out the locations in this web series. How cool is this? No one does that. So like, why are you spending money on it? People, I think, should spend money on sound because no one will watch a bad sound video. They'll watch an iPhone Move, you know, I would watch 60 minutes of something from an iPhone, but if I can't hear the people talking, you're going to turn that's it off. Point. So. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. I, I would say one of the things we've learned is more prep than less prep. And the key is, again, story. Uh, I would shy away with anything with big effects or is uh, attempting to look like a high gloss television series, because I think that's where too much money and too much time is going to be spent. I think the key is to find. Uh, a web series where the story can be told in a way that's fairly compact, usually contained, not a lot of locations, that sort of thing. So ideas that work in those areas because that's a place to save money and then you can spend the money on two or three things that really matter. Obviously, uh, as long as you can, getting the scripts right going in. Even you know what we, what we had with one situation that really worked out well is they did, uh, they did a lot of rehearsals beforehand. They spent a lot of time, they treated it more like theater. Than, than like a normal drama where the actors show up and meet each other the first day of shooting, uh, as you remember well, Simon, back in the day. Um, but uh, it, you know, instead, put that work in in advance so that the show gets the polish from the performances and from the script, and it'll cover off the fact that your budget is not going to be as large. And and still, especially, you know, I agree totally on if it's on the web, but even on broadcast, we can take something and put it on broadcast, and if the story is strong. 
I'm more willing to do that than even if it looks great and the story is really terrible because people will change the channel much faster. And I think with production, um, there are a lot of things that fall under the category of money or time. And although this example is not from a web series, it's from our platform, I think it speaks to a lot of how things can be approached from production. When we first launched and we knew we wanted to be on smart TVs, we wanted to get our Roku channel built. Um, I got quoted 60 to 100 grand to do the type of integration we wanted from developers. We did not have that at the time. Um, and so it took me about a month, but I built it. Yeah. And now we have a CTO that's much smarter than me. Um, but that first version was, you know, time. You know, had, had we had the money, probably a week, really, which is ridiculous if they charge 60 to 100 grand for that. But, um, you know, it took me a month, but I did it. There's a lot of things in the production world that are that way. You might be able to find somebody that's just as good as the person you know that's not available because you can't pay, but it might take you three weeks to find that person. You know, more time and more planning can lower your budget. And if you had the money, then you would just put it together and hire people. But you don't, so it's going to take more time. And don't sacrifice that time and think that you're going to have as good of a project if you don't take that time, if you don't have the money. I think, you know, one other piece of advice is to try to collaborate with with people that already have uh, an audience. Um, that's one of the number one ways uh, on YouTube that people are building their audiences. They, they collaborate with, with other creators that already have a large subscriber base and they leverage each other's subscribers. So um, if, if there's any way that you can kind of work with people and produce content with people that have already have a track record or, or already have an engaged um, audience, that, that could really help kind of take you to the next level. That's good. Cool. And one thing I'd add is we've got big on making pilots these days, which initially I shied away from. I thought it was not the thing to do. I've changed my mind on that because I think the pilot can work out some bugs. Now you lose some efficiencies and it may cost you a little bit more money, but I have really found, I, in fact, I've got a new rule. We won't do anything without a pilot these days because I have found so much was learned during that time period. And when, you know they get the show down and, and you figure out, and also you figure out who you need to drop. Um, before you do a whole bunch of stuff and go, oh boy, that one actor didn't work or something like that. Because I think we're too quick to rush into things and we should just take a, maybe take a step back and think, you know, this is a really intensive, creative process. Let's get it right going in. I'd love to uh, just jump on that point too and, and um, you know, uh, agree with you on that, that. I think when we work pilots, and the pilots that I've seen that go through IPF, they've been very efficient at telling the story. Um, and often I've seen some series that lose that efficiency once they've gone into the full series. And you almost lose interest. So I think um, you don't necessarily have to have that big six-figure budget to be able to tell your story. And so, again, my, my recommendation, the same as Allie's, um, <coughs> is that you, know, you don't need to spend a lot of money to, to have a hit, to have a great story and be able to deliver on that story, if anything, spend your money a little bit wiser and put it towards your marketing promotion. Find how you can cross collaborate with other channels, with other platforms, um, with your audience as opposed to dumping it all into making it slick and glossy and having a 22 minute you know, um, web series that's you know, been split into you know, 10 episodes that you can then go and pitch. Whereas if you spend your money and have 20 episodes and you tend to you know, can push a little bit more of an evergreen series as opposed to Know, a two-month window of release, you'll have something to be able to, to continue to tell your story and to be able to engage with your audience, build your community over time a little bit bigger, mm -hmm. and then be able to go to someone else. If you are still in that process of pitching, then you've got a bigger audience that's followed you. You've got a community, and you've got uh, a supporting cast, let's say, of, of supporting channels or, or celebrities, YouTube stars, etc., that will, will tell a greater story. That's great information. Um, we have five minutes for questions from the audience. Um, have, have I missed a whole bunch of things that are burning up in your minds? Please, this is your chance. These guys know a lot of stuff. Okay, right here. Yeah, I guess, um, uh, do you guys ever, uh, so if someone is, is trying to make a web series, obviously, that's why we're here. Um, uh, uh, do you ever um, take meetings or, or, take, or, or look at material before they've gone to investors and kind of essentially um, help trigger uh, uh, 
investor types and money? You know what I mean? All the time. Yeah. Okay. At more than once a week. How about that? Ah. <coughs> and Enrique, I think you do as well, don't you? No, not no, no more. No. Um, again, we we try to be a little bit more of a of the platform as the technical solution. The tools are there to upload, distribute your content, you know, at your will. Pretty much the, the entire platform. Okay. So uh, we will take those those meetings and those uh, and field those those calls and emails, but we need to see that there's kind of a, a belief in the platform and of building community, of, of building an audience with the platform before we're going to commit anything. Right. So. And Carter, do you wait to see the project? Or? Most of the time. Although we have developed, because of our recognition of crowdfunding, we developed a program um, that we really haven't used yet very much. We had one that was unsuccessful, and I will take partial credit, but they didn't listen to a darn thing that I said. Um, uh, but where we're giving the subscriptions at such a cut rate that it doesn't cost very much for the, for the uh, show to um, provide subscriptions as incentives so that people are getting almost their full value of their donations um, in subscriptions to JTS so that they can not only see that show when it's made, but other shows. Um, and so uh, that's something that we're doing to try to bridge that gap in funding right now. I should say that as a Canadian network, that a lot of the Canadian funding you know, groups require letters and letters of support. So we're a little quicker to give out a letter when there's something, and basically say to the producer, okay, look, for this, letter, your high jump bar is you know, five feet, you have to jump over. When you come back, it's gonna be up here. So you need to get from where you are now to here before we would write you a check, but we're prepared to give you the letter to help you get to the next stage and some constructive criticism on your project, that sort of thing. Ali, is um, Broadband TV ready to start commissioning or licensing or helping out up we, front? We did announce this year um, a co-production deal with Fremantle Media where we're producing original content and and um, with talent within our network, but we, we also have kind of a minimum threshold before we work with the talent, and it's um, 10,000 views a month across um, you know, your, your videos. So we do expect kind of a certain a level of traction, and, and then so that you're, you know, you show that you're, you're committed, and then we can try to help build and, and help you grow from there. Okay. Another question, yes. Um, going back to the question about multiple <coughs> platforms and windows and when to, do whichever. Um, something like Daily Motion or anything else, like is since YouTube is the biggest and the, the one that most people know about, and it's where your views are all calibrated and went on. If say you were at YouTube first, then you went to Daily Motion, would the views from Daily Motion go back to YouTube and like is that the initial platform? Does it link back to that? I say yes and no. Um, Removing any labels of, of which platform is which, or, or first, or, or second, yes, um, the initial answer is one will help contribute to the other. There is no such thing as cannibalization of audience, you know, that's come up, or, um, and in fact, you know, the more platforms you release, the more it'll help build your brand overall. However, if you're trying to maximize your audience on your, your second platform, or your second window, that is, then how are you building your audience or community on that platform? So it's not just good enough that are you've released on YouTube, you've got your 100,000 views, fantastic. And you've released you know, uh, a month later on Vimeo. How are you building the, the traffic to, to that release? So it's not, um, if you're being active on one, how are you, you can't be passive with your subsequent releases. So your own, <coughs> it won't really benefit you if, if you're not actually engaging and utilizing set platform. So same thing with JTS. If that's your first window or second window, what are you doing to promote your, you know, your content on that on that platform? Um, and just to go back to the the, the whole losing of, of audience, um, if you look at a company like Buzzfeed, uh, and we, we talked about this you know backstage earlier, they've been around for for ten years. They're one of the masters of clickbait and listatorials, and they've actually evolved into actual editorial and some journalism alongside with evolving in how they've released content. But they release content on YouTube, they release content on Daily Motion, they release content natively to Facebook video, and and they optimize for each platform. So and, and they're engaging with each platform. Or we've seen channels like IGN or CBS Interactive in the US 
who are releasing on all platforms. And, and if, if there's social media tweets with a Daily Motion link, they're retweeting and they're, they're backing that up. So they're engaging with their, their releases, with their content on all platforms. And it's not just putting all your eggs into the YouTube basket and then saying, oh yeah, why don't we release on X, Y, and Z platforms and we'll see how many views we get. Because that's not really engaging. That's just being passive with those. And that won't really help you all that much. I think it's I think important to understand what, I'm sorry, it, what, you know, from the producer's side, what that means, because when you're the content side, you're saying we've got to push our stuff everywhere because you understand that the audience is going to live on one platform. And so, for example, somebody comes to me and says, I've got 8 million original hits on YouTube, they'll all come to your channel. I say, no, that won't happen. People don't move out of platforms quickly. So, you know, you want to push your content out for that reason, but also, if you're going to somebody else and saying, look at all these people we have on YouTube, I'll bring them all with you, that's not going to happen. For sure. and this may seem counterintuitive, but views are not as important on all platforms. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of times it's about the buzz and what it can help you with the window. Um, for, and the network, from the network side of things, which is how we approach ourselves, um, buzz is much better than uh, views, except for paid subscribers. That's always the best. Um, <laughs> But uh, you look at a show like HBO, Dustin Hoffman had a show called Luck. They renewed it for the second season with something ridiculous for them of like a quarter million views per episode. I mean, my God, can you imagine what their ad revenue would be? They couldn't pay for Dustin Hoffman's hairstylist, <laughs> you know, um, on that. And they renewed it because the show got buzzed even though people weren't watching it. A lot of times if you're on the right platform, you know, and we're looking at expanding this, I wouldn't even say that we're necessarily the right platform that I can say we offer this kind of clout yet, but there are some places that will write about you just because you were picked up on JTS. We want to expand that a lot more. But that first window, if it can give you clout, whether it gets you actual eyeballs because they're not paying subscribers or not, can help you launch later. Uh, Continuum is a show that you may confuse with the Canadian Continuum. <laughs> Ours was first. Um, the, uh, but it got, uh, it didn't have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of views on JTS but it got hundreds of thousands of views after, and it got a ton of publicity when it was first launched in an exclusive great. format. There's lots of great information, you guys. Thank you so much for sharing it all. <laughs>